closer to the dawn of democracy, there were very few opportunities for people living in townships to access quality, private health care at affordable rates. It was difficult then to get into private practice because most private hospitals <laughs> only admitted white patients. You know, those days are apartheid days. Patients were allowed in the private hospital, but I was not allowed to go and see the patients there. At one stage, I was the only black specialist in this country in private practice. I was a pioneer going to white hospitals. I could see the reverse. I, yeah, that black doctor is here again. Skilled black medical staff were employed at government and private hospitals far away from where they lived. And the community who required private healthcare services had to travel long distances to hospitals located in formerly white areas, often at considerable expense. In the late 1960s, a group of visionary businessmen, including Dr. G. M. Piche and Mr. Richard Maponya, under the leadership of Dr. N. Mojana, formed a company whose purpose was to establish a medical scheme and private clinic to serve the disadvantaged communities. In 1985, the group opened its first private hospital, Lesedi Clinic, now renamed Dr. S. K. Matzeke Memorial Hospital finally realizing their vision of bringing private, quality health care to township areas. That led to the formation of the Clinics Health Group in 1992. It was the futuristic ambition of Dr. Peter Matzege that saw the current and continuing growth of Clinics Health Group to greater heights. Clinics also facilitated the advancement of previously disadvantaged doctors by enabling them to open their own specialist practices in these underserviced communities. 30 years later, Clinics continues the legacy by being a respected healthcare group consisting of six private, state-of-the-art hospitals located in Soweto, Johannesburg, Fosloras, Vreenigen and Mafikeng. Together these hospitals have over 1,500 beds and 23 operating theatres. Facilities include ICU beds, 24-hour emergency units, renal dialysis, mental wellness services and 24-hour urgent care. Clinics continues to attract top healthcare professionals, which enables us to meet our mandate of providing a high standard of healthcare products and services, quality patient care and friendly service. Clinics is committed to providing economic opportunities by ensuring that procurement is outsourced to local businesses, supporting entrepreneurs and ensuring a bright future for all. We continue to be administered by a team of diverse and highly skilled medical practitioners who, being rooted in the community, know just what you need to thrive. Clinics Health Group. You are family. Good evening, colleagues. We wish to welcome all of you to another session of our weekly webinars uh, uh, brought to you by Clinics Health Group. It's been an exciting journey to be part of this uh, program of bringing information and medical knowledge to a number of uh, colleagues uh, from both the public and the private sector, and also including uh, medical officers, uh, GPs, uh, specialists, uh, nurses, and all other other allied health uh, professionals uh, to this uh, to these webinars. And so this evening, once more, we we are we are glad and excited to be bringing you an exciting topic that covers the wide spectrum of healthcare delivery in our country, both in the public and the private sector. Uh, but before we do the introductions, I just want to welcome all of you and also indicate that uh, this is a fully accredited uh, webinar. At least this is an ethics session. Those of you who've been asking for sessions with the uh, ethics points, uh, we are there that we are able to do so tonight. And so make sure that when you registered, you've supplied um, us with your full details, giving us your registration numbers according to you, your registration, the profession that you're registered with, and also provide us with your contact details and email address. And those who are registered with HPCS, they know that uh, 
your information as soon as you've given us that information it will be provided and be uploaded to the HPCSA and you'll be then be provided with the full uh, points for attending the session. Normally these sessions are one point or two points depending on the duration of the sessions and the application that you've made. So we are glad that you, you've joined us this evening. And also please make sure that you switch off your, your audio and also your video so that at least we enhance the reception as we continue with our webinars. We know that some of us have been affected, have also been affected by load chain, it just came on our ways. Uh, perhaps others might be affected by, by load chaining. Uh, but nevertheless, we'll continue with our sessions with the session for this evening. And this evening, we are excited to be bringing you a topic that is quite pertinent within the profession. And all of us would love to know what's happening and how to protect ourselves and how to protect uh, the patients in providing quality health care. And the theme or topic for this evening is uh, duty of care and medical negligence. When you were registering, there's a, there's a, there's a preamble uh, that has been put there. Uh, I think uh, our speaker will be talking about that. But we're excited to have Dr. Graham Mawath, who's actually speaking to us all the way from Leeds in the UK. Uh, he's, he's busy there uh, doing part of the work that he does with uh, the organization that he works for. And Howard is the head of medical services Southern Africa Medical Protection Services is a qualified medical practitioner and also a qualified specialist in obstetrics and gynecology. He also has an emphasis. Uh, good evening, all. Uh, apologies. For that. We have lost Dr. Bila for a bit. Sorry. Hi, Dr. Bila, we lost you there for a bit. Oh. Yes. Have you lost me? I think it was no shading. The lights were coming back, and it looks like the lights are back. No problem. Sorry. Am I back now? Yes, it's fine now. Oh, okay. I don't know why you lost. Yeah, also, I was saying. Producer Dr. Ken Howard, who's here with us all the way, is a South African, but at current is, is, is in Leeds, and we're excited. We are grateful that he accepted the invitation to speak to us. And though he's far away, I think the beauty of internet is that we can still log in. Uh, as I said, he's got an MPhil. He's also worked at several hospitals, uh, Livingston, and also he, we worked at Calafon Hospital uh, as the obstetrician and gynecologist, and uh, he was also quite involved in the research in peritonitology and uh, his interest in doing, uh, representing a number of cases led him to study MPhil bioethics. And later on, he left uh, obstetrics and gynecology to join the Medical Protection Society uh, because of his interest in ethics and medical legal matters. As you said, that is the head of medical services. Uh, Medical uh, Production Society, Southern Africa. So we are glad to have you, Howard, and thank you, Graham, uh, for being with us this evening and speaking to us all the way from, from Leeds. And uh, we're talking about the celebrations that are taking place at Leeds for the team uh, making it to the Premier League once more. Thank you and welcome. Thank you. Well, thank you very much um, for the opportunity to speak to you this evening. Um, thank you very much for the welcome and thank you also for introducing me. Maybe a couple of words on Leeds. Uh, of course, many of you will remember that Lucas Radebe was here in Leeds and he's a much celebrated and venerated hero here in Leeds. Although, of course, they can't say Radebe, they call him Radebe. Uh, but be that as it may. Um, this evening, I'm going to be talking about So You Have Been Sued, What Does It Mean? <clears throat> Excuse me. And I'll be talking a little bit about responsibility, accountability, liability, and blame as well, because um, I think those are things that people occasionally get a little bit confused about. And um, I'm particularly interested in the concept of blame. And I also have a particular interest uh, in doctors who have been criminally charged with um, culpable homicide. But this evening I'm talking mainly on litigation and it's a threat that um, sadly um, hangs over 
um, all clinicians, um, not only in South Africa, but around the world. Um, just a couple of words on what I am. You've heard that I am an obstetrician and gynecologist, uh, and I'm not a lawyer. So I say that um, because my one of my areas of interest and one of the reasons I did the MPhil as well is to try and act as a bit of a bridge, um, A, between the lawyers and the medical profession, and with respect to the MPhil, uh, between ethicists and the medical profession, because I think we speak slightly different languages, and it's tr trying to... Um, turn some ethical and legal terms maybe into medicalese. So what I'm not is, I am not a lawyer, so I'm sure some of you will have L LBs. Uh, and do excuse me um, if you're not absolutely um, in agreement with some of the terminology that I use, but what I'm trying to do is simplify things and make it more palatable uh, to our colleagues in the medical profession. Uh, of course, if I was a lawyer, then I'd probably start the presentation with a brief a disclaimer uh, with a little bit of small print uh, and then go on from there. But as I said, I'm not a lawyer, so there'll be no legal disclaimer. So I thought I'd start off with a couple of phrases that to me are obviously Shakespearean for fools rush in where angels fear to tread. A little learning is a dangerous thing. And the one that I'll be talking about tonight mainly is the issue of to err is human, to forgive divine. Uh, or maybe somewhat skeptically, some people say to err is human to forgive against, depart against departmental policy. Now, I was absolutely convinced, of course, that these were quotes from Shakespeare. Uh, and I was somewhat interested to note when I actually looked them up that they're actually uh, quotes by Alexander Pope from his essay on criticism, which is an interesting essay in itself. Um, but it just goes to show how we tend to attribute things to Shakespeare when indeed they're not Shakespeare at all. Um, and there's another term that I'll be using a little bit later that I think is, is incorrectly attributed. So I'll be talking about this to err is human to forgive divine. Of course, there's a group of people who don't necessarily agree with that. Uh, this was just a random search that I did on the internet um, a few years ago and just picking up the name of uh, uh, claimant lawyers and there's a whole host here. You can see this is rather old because you'll see in the top right hand corner there's Ronald Bobaroff and Partners and I note from the South African press that the um, Mr. Bobaroff has now left for Australia and I think the South African government is trying to extradite him back for um, certain misdemeanors. Uh, that he was responsible for. But be that as it may, this is a whole host of uh, claimant lawyers. Um, I often am in South Africa, and if I'm on the road, like you probably listening to the radio, and it's not strange if you drive between Johannesburg and Pretoria, which used to be a relatively quick drive, but now it's becoming longer and longer, to hear at least one or two, if not three advertisements for um, lawyers um, advertising with respect to clinical negligence. So, I mean, they're out there and um, we've got to be aware of this uh, threat that we have. So I'm gonna be talking to a certain extent and I'm gonna just drop my diary. The metaphorical thump. Um, you are sitting maybe in your sitting room and you hear this heavy envelope push through your letterbox to thump on the ground like that. Of course, I realize now in today's modern society, many of us don't have letterboxes. Our post is either delivered to the practice or alternatively to the local postnet um, post box or a post box nearby. But the fact remains is it's opening this rather large and officious looking envelope. And the first thing, of course, I suspect most of us do is sigh a sigh of relief uh, because it's not from the South African Revenue Services. But then as we open it, we realize that there's a letter of demand inside there. Uh, and it's quite possibly also um, accompanied by uh, a document known as the Particulars of Claim, which sets out exactly uh, what the claimant feels you've done wrong and exactly how much you feel uh, they feel that um, you owe them now. I don't for a moment expect you to even be able to see this properly. It's just a little bit to show you the sort of flow diagram of what happens with a claim starting off there with the summons and ending with an appeal or a review. Uh, it's a highly complicated matter, uh, requires the inputs of um, specialist lawyers. I think um, 
specialist lawyers on both sides of the um, argument. Um, for the claimants, they're probably better um, advised should they be using lawyers who specialize in me medical negligence and likewise their um, advocates or counsel. And we, of course, and our competitors, I have no doubt, use what we feel are the best defense lawyers in the country. So essentially, um, if you are sued, what are the issues? Well, if someone wants to sue you, there are three hurdles that they have to cross. There is, they have to prove that you owed the patient a duty of care. They have to show that you breached that duty of care. Um, and then there is a causation argument and the causation argument goes around showing that what the patient is suing you for, the injury that they're suing you for, if you will, is as a result of the breach of duty of care and the breach of duty of care being where the allegation is that your management of the patient didn't come up to scratch. And I'll be talking more about each one of these um, as we go along. So first of all, I'd like you all to think and reflect on your major obligation to patients. And um, you know what is or what are our major obligations to patients when it comes to um, their care? And I think virtually every medical student and probably the vast majority of qualified doctors, the first thing that comes to mind is this term primum non nocere, um, which means firstly, do not harm. Now, I think it's been ascribed to Hippocrates and appearing in the Hippocratic Oath. Um, I don't speak or read Greek, but I'm told it doesn't actually appear in the Hippocratic Oath. This, of course, is Latin anyway. And it was something that was brought up around the 17th century, although I think the sentiment almost definitely appears in the Hippocratic Oath. And the sentiment is, firstly, do not harm which of course is a negative obligation, an obligation not to harm someone. There's no positive obligation there. The obligation is not to harm. And it's very similar really to your obligation to everyone around you. I mean, of course, people can sue you left, right and center for negligence on a whole host of areas. And the vast majority goes around not harming someone. You've harmed someone, so they say there is an obligation not to harm you. But in medicine, uh, we have a special relationship. We have the doctor-patient relationship or the dentist-patient relationship, if you will, or whatever healthcare professional patient relationship. So there is a slightly different uh, fiduciary relationship there, uh, which I think, well, I know, to be quite honest, takes us beyond this major obligation of firstly, do not harm. So what is a brief summary of your legal obligation to patients or your other legal obligation to patients? And I think a brief summary is thou shalt take care. I mean, that's why patients come to you. Firstly, I'm sure they don't really think that they're going to see the doctor so he doesn't harm me. They think to themselves, well, I'm going to go and see this healthcare professional. So they'll take care of me. They'll do something positive uh, on my behalf. So not only do you have the obligation not to harm, but you have the obligation to take care. Thou shalt take care. And you can summarize that even more briefly into take care. So we have a negative obligation and the obligation is primum non nicera, do not harm. You can hear the negative there, do not harm. But we also have a positive obligation and there you can hear take care, you must take care. And that is primarily why patients come to see you. So when someone asks you about your obligations to, pay, uh, to patients and it shoots across your mind because it's, I think it's been inculcated into all of us, this primum non nocere, there's an equally, if not more important obligation, that positive obligation to take care. And to be quite honest, if you look at the majority of litigation um, against doctors, it is around this issue of um, taking care of patients. So I'll talk a little bit more in detail about this, but if you look at the elements of delict in South African law, the first thing that they look at, the lawyers look at, is the conduct. Was the conduct an act or an omission? Now, the act is the act where you cause harm. And that's what happens in the vast majority of cases. If there's an omission, it's not impossible if there's not a special relationship between you and the individual who's suing you, that 
that you they will be unsuccessful if it's an omission. But in our case, we have a specific obligation to take care. So we can be sued in delict or in negligence, either for conduct where we have an act, where we do something, or an omission where we can be sued for something that we didn't do. Um, I'll speak briefly a little bit further on of wrongfulness uh, and the like. So remember then we have a positive and a negative obligation. So we can be sued in delict or in negligence, either for acts or omissions. So for you, those of you who are naive to the law, um, a little bit about a civil claim, you'll be aware of the fact that we have the civil law and the criminal law. And firstly, a little bit about the civil law, it's private law, and it's to uphold an individual or a corporate's interest and rights. It's to compensate and protect. I think the important point, and I'll come back to this a little bit later, is it's not punitive. It's merely a conduit for money to flow, so damages or compensation. The idea of civil law is not to punish you. Um, it is around a debt that you owe. It's the debt, you could say, is no different to going into your local pick and pay, picking up a product and walking to the till. You owe a debt for that particular product. In this particular case, what has happened is someone is saying that they have been injured or disadvantaged as a result of your negligence, and you now owe them a debt. And that is what the law of negligence or delict is about, and it's about the the flow of money, a conduit of money, uh, from someone who's harmed someone to someone who was harmed. Um, it can be directed by individuals or corporates, and I anticipate that would be important, particularly um, looking at your um, interesting uh, video earlier on. Uh, there'll be a large corporate there as well. The other thing that we have to be careful of is that the um, idea of negligence, it can be vicarious. In other words, if you employ professionals, then you can be vicariously liable for their acts or omissions, even if you have nothing to do with the actual care itself. Now, earlier today, I was speaking to a group of radiologists, and that's particularly salient for radiologists, because you'll be aware of the fact the vast majority of large radiological practices employ um, radiographers, uh, maybe ultrasonographers, uh, and a whole group of professionals. Um, and often, more often than not, if there's litigation, then the radiographer or the ultrasonographer who may or may not have been involved in the case is not mentioned in the particulars of claim. Either the practice or the doctor is mentioned in the particulars of claim and they are held to be vicariously liable. So in other words, you are liable for their acts or omissions, even if you never ever saw the patient, it's possible that you could be very vicariously liable for their acts or omissions. And the other uh, great example of that, of course, is the state, uh, where the state is vicariously liable um, for the acts or omissions of people who are employed by the state. So if you work for the state and you're working on a state patient in a state hospital and you are an employed state doctor, then the state is vicariously liable for your acts or omissions. And although you may be named in the particulars of claim, at the end of the day, the state is responsible for compensating the patient. Uh, we've got some interesting terminology in South Africa. There's still a tendency to call a claimant a plaintiff, <coughs> excuse me, although I prefer the word claimant because it's, it's a lot clearer. People become confused if you talk about the pla plaintiff. And the defendant, of course, um, is fairly obvious. That's the person who claims that they haven't been negligent. Uh, the onus of proof in a civil claim is based on the balance of probabilities. So if, if I want to, um, I have to show on the balance of probabilities, um, it's more likely than not that I wasn't negligent. Or alternatively, the claimant has to show that it's more likely than, than not that you were negligent. So the bonus, the onus of proof falls on the claimant. They have to show that you were negligent. But legally speaking, it's a relatively low bar. It's 50-50. All you've got to do is convince the judge that you're story, your argument, your experts, uh, their defense and their reasoning um, trumps that of the um, the other side. So it's a relatively low bar um, when it's compared to uh, criminal law, of course, which I'll talk about in a moment. 
I'm also really interested, I told you earlier on that I'm interested in this concept of guilt, and we'll move on to that a little bit later, but in this triad, the distinction between responsibility, accountability, and liability, there's very definite distinctions here. And the best way for me to explain them possibly is to use the state as an example. Let's say that you were an intern in a state hospital and you were working at night and you were under the supervision of a registrar or possibly a consultant or a registrar and a consultant. And the registrar asks you to do something and you go and do it. And despite you doing it to your very best, something goes wrong and you are responsible for what happened. You did it. You are responsible for it. But who's accountable? Who is answerable? Who at the end of the day takes the, let's say, the decision-making responsibility, the accountability? And that's quite possibly going to be the registrar or the consultant. They would be held accountable. Now, as professionals, of course, even an intern is held responsible and accountable. And let's say that the patient complains to the Health Professions Council. They might say that the the, 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 the intern is partially accountable. But at the end of the day, if they're working under supervision, it's quite possible they'll also um, criticize the registrar and or the consultant because they are accountable. They weren't responsible. They might not have been directly involved, but they are accountable. But what if the patient sues? Who then compensates the patient? Now, remember I said earlier on, as a result of the Treasury regulations, the state is vicariously liable for the acts or omissions of state doctors. If the patient sues the hospital, despite the fact that the negligence may have been, if there was negligence, that of the intern, despite the fact that the HPCSA may have criticized the registrar because they've held the registrar or the consultant primarily accountable, the liability, who is going to pay the patient or recompensate the patient or their family falls to the state. So there's three different concepts here, responsibility, accountability, and liability. And remember going back to vicarious liability, um, someone who works for you, let's say you are a radiologist and a radiographer does something wrong, it's not impossible that while the radiographer is actually responsible for the error or the negligence, you will be held accountable quite possibly. And if the patient decides to sue, that's more than likely than not that they're going to go for the practice or the doctor who they will anticipate is adequately indemnified or insured. So these are important distinctions uh, that one has to think about on occasions. <clears throat> Turning to criminal law, culpable homicide, um, you'll be aware of the fact that there is a doctor currently in Gauteng who's been charged with murder in a very sad case. Um, we've also had an obstetrician and gynecologist who spent some time in prison following the sad death of a young patient um, as a result of a postpartum hemorrhage. Uh, he was one of our members. It was a very sad day to send him to prison or have him see him being sent to prison. Uh, we continued with our appeals there and eventually the um, conviction was overturned in the constitutional court but rather sadly for the member by the time that had happened and the way the law works out he'd already been released from prison but at least we quashed his conviction so turning to criminal law it's public law and it's to uphold the public interests and law and order the whole idea of criminal law deep down is to deter, but also to punish. It's to protect society. Remember with negligence, you've got two parties, one party, there's a, there's a sort of equality of arms almost on both sides here in uh, criminal law. Uh, it's directed by the National Prosecuting Authority. So, um, you know, they're a, a fairly powerful group of people uh, and they have some fairly high powered lawyers um, at their disposal. Of course, one talks about the accused now, as opposed to the plaintiff and the, and the defendant, and it's the accused versus the state. Here, the onus of proof is considerably higher, of course. It's beyond reasonable doubt. So um, beyond reasonable doubt, 
means much higher than on the balance of probabilities. There can't be reasonable doubt uh, that the um, individual who's being charged uh, is criminally responsible. Uh, the state has to discharge the burden of proof. So remember in negligence, it's the claimant that is responsible for proving negligence. Um, in a criminal case, it is the state that's responsible to prove um, that a criminal act occurred and that the um, accused is responsible for that criminal act. If they're unsuccessful, uh, there's no such thing as a draw. The, um, the accused then is found not guilty. Um, of course, if the outcome is to the accused disadvantage, a con conviction um, damages the patient's or the individual's relationship with society tangibly. I mean, it's who wants to have a criminal conviction and symbolically, uh, it might be difficult to travel or worse still, uh, you might have to go to prison as sadly happened in the particular case that I was talking about. Um, if at the end of the state's case, um, uh, the lawyers acting on behalf of the accused feel that there's no case to answer, they can ask for a discharge application and that occurs on occasions. So a little bit like with the HPCSA as well, uh, on occasions, if we feel that the HPCSA hasn't proven their case and there is no charge really for um, our member or the um, respondent to answer, uh, then we will go for discharge. In other words, we don't even have to lease evidence. Uh, we try and get the case uh, resolved there. So there's a, there are massive differences between um, civil law and criminal law. So let's go back to these three um, hurdles, if you will, that the claimant has to prove to be successful in, in um, civil law. Firstly, there's the duty of care. Now, the duty of care is, did you owe this particular patient a duty of care? And almost inevitably, in medical cases, there is a duty of care. If you're managing a patient, then you have the duty of care to that patient. Um, and I can think of only two cases that in the 20 odd years that I've been involved in South African cases um, where we have argued against the duty of care. Um, the one was, if I remember correctly, a GP in Umschlange. Uh, it was around a holiday maker. Uh, there was no relationship between the two and the holiday maker tried to draw the GP into a particular case. And if memory serves me correctly, we were successful there. Uh, the other interesting case is one that's been reported, so I can use the names, is the so-called Suleiman case. Um, it's the case of an unfortunate obstetrician and gynecologist <clears throat> who was covering for a colleague of his. And um, during the course of the morning, the hospital uh, phoned the obstetrician and gynecologist and sought his advice. Uh, and he gave some advice. He gave some good advice, in fairness. And what happened then was for the rest of the day, he wasn't called until in the early evening when he was called. Uh, he realized during the course of the telephone conversation that there was problems, uh, went out and performed a cesarean section. And sadly, the baby had cerebral palsy. Um, the there was a claim which was successful against one of the large hospital groups. Uh, and they said, but hold on a second. Uh, we think that the obstetrician and gynecologist should also be um, party to this claim. They should also be a defendant. Um, and he took exception to that. Uh, I think it eventually landed up in the Supreme Court of Appeal. And it's important to note that the Supreme Court of Appeal said that he said that his duty of care only started when he arrived in the hospital and saw the patient for the first time. And sadly for him, the Supreme Court of Appeal disagreed with him. And they said that the duty of care um, arose at the first telephone conversation. So I think he was pulled into a multi-million rand claim, that probably um, set him up at least 10 million rand. Um, then we've got the breach of duty of care. Now, the breach of duty of care is what is the standard of care that is expected of a doctor? And the standard of care that's expected of a doctor is what would a reasonable doctor do under similar circumstances? Um, in a moment, I'll be talking about foreseeability, and I'll say a little bit more about that in a moment. And then finally, um, if the patient can prove that you had a duty of care to them, 
uh, that your care didn't reach the standard of a reasonable doctor under similar circumstances, then the patient also has to prove that the injury that they're suing you for is as a result of that breach of duty of care. Now, you might think that it's always natural that if there's negligence, then obviously the injury is, is as a result of the negligence. <clears throat> and the best way to illustrate that that not being the case possibly uh, is in cerebral palsy cases. Now, we know that the vast minority of cerebral palsy is as a result of intrapartum asphyxia. Now, if a child develops cerebral palsy and the parents subsequently sue the doctor concerned, and there may even be, clearly the doctor was responsible for the, part of the patient's intrapartum management, so there will be a duty of care. The care might not have been exactly what um, one would have wished for, but it's clear that the type of cerebral palsy that the child suffers from uh, is not the cerebral palsy associated with intrapartum asphyxia, then sadly for the claimant, the case will fail because although it's cerebral palsy, the cerebral palsy is not as a result of the alleged um, poor care. Uh, it's as a result of another reason. So there's, uh, it's important that you've got to link the, the, um, the injury uh, to any negligence that's occurred. And then finally, the other part that we of, often get involved in, particularly in large cases, uh, is the issue of quantum. How much, um, once we've accepted that the um, doctor is liable, how much does the doctor owe for that injury? <clears throat> and you can imagine, again, in cerebral palsy cases or the likes, where we're talking of 20 to 25 million rand claims, that they can be fairly hefty and lengthy um, court cases about exactly um, how much is owed. So those are the three hurdles. They've got to prove that there was a duty of care. They've got to prove that the care was not up to standard, does not reach the standard that would be anticipated of a reasonable doctor under similar circumstances. And finally, they have to prove that the injury that they are claiming for is as a result of the substandard care that was given. <clears throat> I'm just gonna have a sip of water. So if you look at the elements of delict in South African law, the first one we've spoken about is conduct, act or omission. Then we move on to the wrongfulness of the conduct. Now, I'm not going to go into that. You could write a PhD or indeed many PhD theses have been written on the wrongfulness concept in South African law. But very, very briefly um, paraphrased, it goes around that if you, through your act or omission, harm someone else, then there's a reasonable chance that there's a wrongfulness of conduct. And let's just leave it at that. It's, it's far, far more complicated. But for the, intent, for the um, reasons of this lecture, I think it's more than enough. Then there has to be fault. In the vast majority of cases, the fault is negligence. But we can also talk a little bit about intention because I'm particularly interested in that area as well. Then we move on to causation, which I think to a large extent I've hopefully covered. But the question is asked is but for, so but for the negligence, would the injury have occurred? So if there wasn't the negligence, would the injury have occurred? If the answer is um, but for the negligence, the injury would have occurred, then probably the claimant is going to be successful. And then you move on to the fifth step, which is the damages step. And that is the one where we decide how much a claim um, is worth, how much would be we be willing to pay or how much would the claimant be willing to accept uh, for the injury that's been caused as a result um, of the negligence. Now, I was really interested, it's probably about two years ago now, I was speaking to a colleague of mine who I've known for many years. <clears throat> we were undergraduates together uh, and he was involved in a particular case uh, he, he was and, and still is an MPS member. And um, we felt that it was going, he, he was involved in a negligence claim that would be impossible for us to defend for numerous reasons. Probably the most salient of which, sadly, was the fact that um, we didn't have good enough notes to uh, protect our position. And um, this... Um, doctor kept on saying to me, Graham, but I'm not guilty of negligence. I'm not guilty of negligence. And it really interested me because the question really about 
is one ever guilty of negligence? And um, that's what I'm going to go into in a little bit more detail in the next few minutes. So remember the triad of responsibility, accountability, and liability. When you're talking about blameworthiness, there are three states of mind, I suppose, three areas that you can move into. One is negligence, the other is recklessness, and the third one is intent. Now, negligence is inadvertent. I'll be talking about foreseeability in a moment, but really the question that is asked in the court is, was the outcome foreseeable? And being foreseeable, was it preventable? So there's an issue of foreseeability. And in the vast majority of negligence cases, it might be that there's a complication that if you ask the doctor about it before they were involved or after they were involved, would clearly know about it. But in the moment, they didn't think about it because if they had thought about it, they probably would have taken steps to stop the negligence or the injury from occurring. So negligence is inadvertent. It's not something that you turn your mind to. Um, it's an oversight. Um, it's a degree of maybe you could say carelessness. It's not that you don't care but there is a moment of carelessness. Recklessness, on the other hand, is where you have foresight of a bad outcome. You realize that you might be doing something wrong, but you put it aside and you don't let it influence you so you continue nevertheless. And then finally, intent, of course, is you have the foresight and you actually want to do what's happened. So, the area of negligence is an area to a large extent in civil law. Um, of course, we get it in criminal law as well, because in culpable homicide, the, the, the um, fault in culpable homicide is negligence. And the allegation is that the doctor should have foreseen the death and having foreseen the possibility of death should have prevented it from happening. Recklessness and intent, on the other hand, there you have turned your mind to something, you, you have thought about it, or the court at least thinks that you've thought about it. Now, to summarize maybe recklessness in the South African legal concept that would be relatively easily understandable is to a large extent, recklessness is synonymous to uh, what is known in South African law as dolus eventualis. And I'm sure you'll remember the Oscar Pistorius trial a few years ago. And um, Oscar, if I remember correctly, was eventually found guilty of murder. And that was under the, uh, the rubric of recklessness or dolus eventualis, uh, shooting through the door like that with the knowledge that someone might, might have been behind was at the least reckless. And shooting like that, you must have foreseen or you should have foreseen must have foreseen uh, that you ran the risk of killing someone. Intent is um, dolus directus using South African law where you go out to intentionally do something and I don't think we'll struggle with that concept at all. So the interesting thing really is about foreseeability. So the question that is asked in negligence is was the harm foreseeable and having been foreseeable would the reasonable doctor have foreseen the harm? And having foreseen the harm, would they have taken reasonable steps to stop it from occurring? That is the essence of the question that the expert is asked. Whereas in criminal law, it goes around what was foreseen. And the lawyers have nice terminology for this. They talk about objective as opposed to subjective foreseeability. Now, objective foreseeability means they use a standard, an objective standard. Uh, in negligence, generally, it's the reasonable person under similar circumstances. For those of you um, who read some of the older cases, you'll see that what would the man on the Clapham omnibus have done? So in South African law, um, when it comes to medical negligence, is what would the reasonable doctor under similar circumstances have done? So it's not the average doctor, it's the reasonable doctor. What would the reasonable doctor have done under similar circumstances? And that is an objective um, approach that they take. They say it's objective because we're measuring you against the reasonable doctor. 
When it comes to foreseen and criminal law, we're talking about subjective foreseeability. So in other words, the, the feeling is that the subject themselves actually foresaw that outcome, and hence the term subjective foreseeability. I'm not going to go into that in any more detail. It becomes very interesting uh, when you're talking about the likes of um, dolus eventualis um, or um, um, direct murder. So if we move beyond that a triad that we had, this onto the pentad, so we've got, you can be responsible, you can be accountable. If you harm someone through negligence, you can be liable. The question of blameworthiness, to my mind, goes around a state of mind. I don't think personally that you can be blameworthy, morally blameworthy. Um, if you are negligent, it's an inadvertent error. You didn't do it on purpose. You didn't turn your mind to something. Someone might say, well, it's unacceptable that you are careless. But um, criminal law, there is no criminal law um, with respect to criminal uh, to negligence in South Africa for injuries, unless, of course, there is the um, the patient dies. And um, for that also, I don't want to take, or I, I suppose I should remind you that if you don't take consent, it's possible that you can assault a that, <clears throat> that would also be criminal law. And then finally, the issue of punishment, of course, uh, you shouldn't punish people unless they are blameworthy. So subjective foreseeability, I think, is responsible. In, you need for blameworthiness. You need to know that the person actually foresaw the outcome, either put the patient or whoever at unreasonable risk and continued nevertheless, or alternatively did something with intent. So that it was foreseen, it's subjective foresight. So in closing, really, then just to remind you of the three hurdles in negligence, the simple idea is the duty of care, which in the vast majority of cases is almost automatic. The next question is, did you manage the patient as a reasonable doctor would have done under similar circumstances? Did you foresee the outcome that could have occurred or that did occur? And should you have taken reasonable steps? Would the reasonable doctor have foreseen that outcome and taken steps to stop it from occurring? And finally, the hurdle that they have to cross the causation hurdle is, is the injury that they are claiming for as a result of the breach of duty of care or the suboptimal care that's subsequently or previously been shown? The elements of delict in South African law is conduct, the act or omission, the idea of wrongfulness, it's seldom that that's an issue of content or conflict. Um, fault in delict is inevitably negligence. Causation is that but for test. And of course, there's the issue of damages. And then we go on to the quantum. So there's the pentad, responsibility, accountability, liability, blameworthiness or culpability, and finally punishment. So thank you very much for your attention, and I'd be more than happy uh, to take questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Howard, for this presentation. I think you just explained everything about um, medical negligence and duty of care in a very simplified manner, so that we are able to understand what, uh, what uh, every doctor is exposed to, you know, what can happen what can go wrong and uh, what, when, when if anything goes wrong, what to do perhaps, we need to discuss that. But I think it is quite an, in a, a helpful uh, uh, discussion that you've had. And I've seen some colleagues have uh, posted some questions. Yes, uh, I've, uh, just, I've just gone into the... Into the um... Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll take them one, one, one by one. And I, I will encourage all colleagues, uh, if they have questions, please uh, do post them on the chat line, which only have this uh, chat box that we have for, for, for posting questions and making comments. As you can see, the first one from Dr. Polakov, uh, can a plaintiff complain to the HPCSA in addition to a civil claim or can a civil claim trump a further complaint to the HPCSA? Well, the um, a patient of course can complain to who they wish to complain to. Um, they can complain to the HPCSA um, I've got an article from a few years ago in the Pretoria News where the HPCSA um, uh, encourages patients to complain if there is um, civil litigation, if there's a negligence case. 
uh, certain regulators, not the HPCSA and not the GMC, I might add, uh, make it a um, part of the registration process. In other words, if there's a claim of negligence against you, you have to report it to the regulator. Um, we see it happening on occasions. Um, also, what happens is a patient issues a letter of demand and also threatens um, the doctor with the HPCSA in the hope that we run scared and then pay them so uh, they won't go to the HPCSA. Uh, we tend not to do that. Um, what we've also had, sadly, on occasions is that um, there'll be litigation where we are successful in defending a patient and then the patient complains to the HPCSA. Uh, or, on the other hand, where we are unsuccessful and make a, patient, a, 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 a payment to the patient and they subsequently complain to the HPCSA. So, um, you know, it's, it's a patient's prerogative and uh, the HPCSA, if they receive the complaint, uh, are obliged to investigate it and follow it up. And, um, you know, that's their job. Uh, and I'm not here to criticize them for that. I mean, that's that's why they are the regulator. So hopefully that answers your question. Yeah, sure. Thanks a lot. I hope it does. And Dr. Mkari wants to know, are we compelled to provide clinical records to lawyers, e.g., uh, like the RAF claims, even when we have, uh, so it just jumped now, even when you've completed relevant forms and signed affidavits under oath, why are our reports not trusted even when done under oath? Perhaps you can even touch on the, you know, these issues of uh, pay and propia when it, when it comes yeah. to this. Yeah. Um, well, uh, of course, prior the Promotion of Access to Information Act uh, entitles a patient to a copy of their record. So, I mean, there are certain prerequisites and there's a very, very small fee, which I think was uplifted about a year ago. Uh, but it still remains a um, very um, small amount. Uh, but a patient essentially is um, entitled to um, their um, their records. Uh, I think that would be the default setting, I'm afraid. Okay. Uh, Dr. Mabas, I want to know what about consent forms signed only for procedures or consultations? Well, it's... <laughs> It's very, very difficult to give uh, uh, advice on consent forms. I think there's absolutely no doubt uh, that if you're going to do a procedure uh, where there's risk, then probably it would be prudent to have a consent form um, filled in. The, there's a couple of things as well. You know, one of the first things that we always look at, of course, in the re medical records is for the consent form. Uh, and rather sadly, um, often the only consent form we can find uh, has been filled in by a rather junior staff nurse when the patient was admitted to hospital. Uh, and of course, what happens then is the clever lawyers get the little staff nurse um, on the um, stand uh, and then start cross-examining them on the risks and complications of the particular procedure. And uh, it doesn't bode well because, of course, they're not well informed about those risks and things like that. So I think um, consent is an important concept. Um, I think if you're going to do something interventional, it would be prudent always to have written consent. There's no legal requirement. Um, I'm a little bit of a skeptic, but when it comes to the law, I'm afraid. Personally, I've come to the, it's, it's not what happened or didn't happen. It's what you can prove happened or didn't happen. So anything that you've got that can help your side of the story, uh, your version of events uh, mm -hmm. will be helpful to you. Okay. In terms of consent forms, you know, when you know, there are differences between the public sector and the, and, and the private sector, just generally, also I assume, is that the public sector got consent forms designed by the institution or the Department of Health. And in the private sector, it seems like the, 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 the specialists have their own, can they have their own consent forms rather than in being a, a hospital-wide to group-wise a consent form for them to to fill in and, and, and where, 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 where do you make the discharge between the hospital and the specialist in terms of that? Well, I mean, my experience is that some hospital groups have consent forms. Um, some of the specialist societies have consent forms um, specially made up for common procedures. <coughs> Excuse me, some doctors have their own consent forms made up for the procedures that they tend to um, do. Um, and some doctors um, just um, speak to the patient and maybe just put consent in a tick. So there's a whole host of um, areas there, you, you know, different types of consent forms. Um, you, you know, the interesting thing about South African law is there is a doctrine, 
a doctrine of informed consent in South African law, because if you look at the National Health Act, and forgive me, I can't remember if it's section five or section six, but it very clearly sets out um, the issue of consent, you know, which is unusual. Um, in English law, for example, no such thing happens. Um, you know, consent is common law. So it's clearly set out in South African law and also clearly set out under section five or six of the National Health Act is the obligation to tell a patient um, more or less what the procedure will cost. Uh, and one of the things that we uh, tend to advise our members against is not to give them a quote, but rather to give them a, a cost estimate, because people tend to think of, of, of a quote as being um, written in, 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 um, in stone, if you will, uh, whereas a cost estimate, they realize it is an estimate of the cost. Okay. This question, I think you were, you were expecting it, you know, uh, from Professor Langren, you know it very well. Okay. Thank you for a great uh, talk, Graham. I find the concept of the accusation of criminal intent against surgeons and anesthetists in South Africa quite unacceptable. Surely there needs to be some protection for doctors to prevent us. It is almost as if we are fair, fair game. You know, you, you mentioned two, two cases of uh, doctors who were criminally charged, I think, yeah. Yeah, well, yeah, um, so I know maybe before you answer, I know that I'm going to put some of the colleagues on the spot. There are people from the HPCSA here. I know that they are not here in their own <laughs> positions, and, but they could maybe make a, a comment uh, because that has been a quite a, a, a matter for a, a contentious matter. Or there, there's been an uproar also by quite a number of uh, colleagues in, 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 a, in, in the country when these cases went to the courts. Well, maybe while they're thinking about it, maybe I should. Um, yeah, no, that's fine. You can wait. I was just trying yeah. to put you. You want to? You want to? I think Prof. Langan wants to hear your comment. Your opinion. Um, I think the import the 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 important thing to me really is is the issue of intent. Once there's intent, then you've moved into the area of um, dolus eventualis or or um, dolus directus, and we're talking about murder. Now there is a doctor who's been charged with murder. Uh, and that is very frightening, but it's extremely rare, more common. And we've seen numerous cases like this. And, um, you know, there was going to be a big case um, um, in Pretoria recently, uh, but sadly the, um, the doctor accused and died. Um, but it goes around culpable homicide. Uh, and culpable homicide is where th there's inadvertent, um, it's part of the care uh, and due to possibly a negligent oversight on behalf of the doctor, if they're found guilty, um, then the doctor is found guilty of culpable homicide, which is a criminal offence, uh, and runs the risk of going to prison. And it is not a theoretical risk. It is a real risk, um, as we know, um, because we've had a colleague who spent time in prison. Mm -hmm. Now, like Professor Lundgren, I feel very uncomfortable with that. We've spoken to the... Um, the um, Medical Association. Um, I know that they are very keen to have a uh, um, uh, and involve the likes of the HPCSA and possibly government in this. Um, you, the problem in South African law is that the level of negligence is low. So uh, we say, you know, what would a reasonable doctor have done? If you look at English law, then there has to be gross negligence. Now, gross negligence, to my mind, is very different to negligence. The question is very different. In negligence, you ask yourself, what would the reasonable doctor have done under similar circumstances? Now, that's, that's quite a low threshold, to be quite honest. In gross negligence, you say what this doctor did, no reasonable doctor would have done under the circumstances. That, that's yeah. vastly different um, level. If you look at a place like Scotland, they've gone even further and they've moved to recklessness. So in Scotland to be found guilty, and they also use the term culpable homicide, whereas in the UK and New Zealand, they use the term manslaughter. In Scotland, it's got to be recklessness. So there is a degree of intent. Now, recklessness is that you know that you are putting a patient at unreasonable risk and you continue nevertheless. That's a much higher, there is a level of intent there much more yeah. difficult to prove, a much higher level. I speak under correction, but I think subsequent to bringing recklessness in, in Scotland, uh, there hasn't been a single um, conviction. 
Now, the problem we have in South Africa is one can equate recklessness to a certain extent to the concept of dolus eventualis, uh, which is um, a murder conviction in South Africa. So I think success for us would be to change the level from negligence to gross negligence. So in other words, if someone did something that no reasonable doctor would do under the circumstances. So let me give you an example and um, I hope uh, Chris Lundgren won't take exception to this example. Let's say it's an anaesthetist and they do something that the average anaesthetist or the reasonable anaesthetist wouldn't have done under the circumstances and the patient dies. Then in current South African law, they can be found guilty of culpable homicide and go to prison. If we move it, let's say, to gross negligence, it's slightly different. So here, let's say, to convict an anaesthetist, let's say you have an anaesthetist who is working with a sick patient, takes a telephone call, leaves the theatre, goes outside. As he walks outside or she walks outside, realises that there's something going wrong, continues with their telephone conversation. When it's over, then goes to the bathroom and then goes and has a cup of tea and then comes back to theatre to find the patient moribund. Now, that is gross negligence. And I don't think any of us uh, would take exception to a colleague like that um, facing the possibility of a culpable homicide. Um, uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, that one is, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I'm trying to show that there's a vast difference. You know, when I read through cases, particularly obstetric cases or gynae cases, I often think there but for the grace of God go I. And that's all of us for negligence. You know, it's an inadvertent oversight. We've all been negligent on occasions, I can assure you. But the outcome has not been bad and the patient definitely hasn't died. Um, and it's just such a low um, threshold, I think, for the possibility of a criminal conviction where it's inadvertent. You haven't turned your mind to it. Of course, yeah. it's easy for me to say because I haven't lost a relative you know, through a patient, through a doctor's yeah. um, negligence. Yeah. But um, I, I, I do think um, South African doctors are at an unreasonably high risk. Yeah, you, you, you've been giving your, your inputs to the Law Commission. I think there's some process that is underway now with the Justice Department mm -hmm. uh, comments on that and, and uh, the, the process that is unfolding. Uh, you may comment about the, the possibilities of affecting um, some changes in the law. That's correct. We've oh, uh, now you're going to put me on the spot if you ask me what we said. <laughs> no, no, I didn't ask you that. <laughs> but you, you, you we, we've got it. You know, it's, it's you no, know, the submission is. I think it's available publicly. Yes. Some of them. Yeah. I you want to comment? Another one um, is a duty of care doctrine still app applicable in the South African context as opposed to a reasonable person test as a test okay. for negligence. I think you're asking two very different questions there. The duty of care is your duty to the patient. The reasonable person test is the standard of care. So once you have a duty of care, if we establish that I have a duty of care to you, then the next question the lawyers have to ask is, did that, given that duty of care, what was the standard of care given? So there's, the, the, there's a distinction between duty of care which you, you will remember is the first hurdle that needs to be crossed, as opposed to the second, which is the um, the standard of care. Mm -hmm. Can I go back to the, the case of the obstetricians? Uh, you, you, you mentioned that it's, it's so likely that there is a possibility of them being negligent in a way because of what happened, but you said that sometimes a life is not lost. There is an issue that the, 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 the premiums that have to be paid by obstetricians and gynecologists is quite high. And, um, uh, and some of them perhaps may, may not want to be able to, to do that and take a risk. Would you, what would, what would be your, your advice to such colleagues to say, no, well, not that you know, mentioned cases of what, what might go wrong? Yeah, the, well, the, the problem with obstetrics is, um, you know, two things decide um, to a large extent um, what premiums would be is how often you're sued and how much you're sued for as a group. 
Now, the problem with obstetrics in particular, and pediatrics to a certain extent, to a lesser extent, is, you know, we look at massive claims. Now, obstetricians have two, they are a little bit, they're not like a dromedaris camel, which has one hump of risk. They have two, they're like a Bactrian camel. They have the early risk of missed structural and chromosomal abnormalities, uh, you know, so Down syndrome, fair enough, becoming less common. Um, um, the likes of, um, um, oh, neural tube defects. You know, so now those claims all come in at around 20 million rand a pop. And then, of course, they have the intrapartum risk, where, again, we're talking 25, um, you know, 30 million. We've had one for 90 million with twins. Um, fortunately, mm -hmm. that's fallen aside. So there are massive, massive claims. And therein lies the rub. If you look at the NHS, for example, 50% of their liability is obstetric liability. And about off the top of my head, about 40% of our liability is obstetric liability. So the problem for obstetrics and gynecology is not that they are bad doctors. It is that the claims are so high. Uh, and I've written a couple of articles uh, that are in the South African Medical Journal and the South African Journal of Bioethics and Law. And I quote um, someone from one of the American articles, which is really interesting, is that it's never been safer to have a baby, but never been more unsafe to be an obstetrician and gynecologist. Oh. It sums it up. Yes. <laughs> I don't see any further questions. I, I would have thought maybe colleagues from other associations or could uh, just maybe have one or two questions for you. Uh, but um, perhaps the, you've covered so much in greater detail that there isn't a lot to, to ask uh, from this presentation. Uh, if there are no further questions, if uh, unless there's someone who just wants to uh, raise and unmute themselves and ask a question, I'm going to move on and ask uh, Dr. Enes Kenoshi, uh, who is the Chief of Operations uh, within uh, Clinics Health Group to make the last comment and uh, close remarks. Is it still there? Oh, it doesn't look like. I'm going to ask uh, Professor Langren if you can just uh, do the closing remarks for us, if it's okay, okay with us doing that, uh, working with us in the risk committee. That's a bit Amazing. of a curveball, Dr. Vila. <laughs> you know me. <laughs> That's a bit unfair. Hi, Graham. Hi, hi Chris. <laughs> um, sure. Graham, you, you're just amazing. Um, you covered absolutely everything. And I have to tell you that, that I sent Dr. Vila that article from the UK on duty of care, because I think it's, it's a very important article in medical neg negligence. Mm. And he said to me, who's the expert on this? And I said, there's only one expert on this, and that's Graham Howarth. And I think you have insight into Scottish law, English law, and of course, South African law. And so you've got an overall perspective on the subject. And I still find it very scary that um, whilst I accept the issue of intent and, and um, accusations of murder horrific, um, even culpable homicide mm -hmm. is, is terrible. And Absolutely. you didn't finish answering Dr. Biller's question on what's happening in legislative areas in South Africa. But, um, you know, I think we all practice and trepidation because when's it my turn? And as you said, there but for the grace of God go I. So thank you for a very comprehensive talk. Um, and Dr. Bila, you've got the article and I think it's worth sharing on, on medical negligence and those three key areas of duty of care, um, et cetera, that, that Graham presented. So thank you very much, Graham. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity.
Thanks, thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Kalimarath, and, and thanks a lot, Prof. Langer, for uh, you know responding so quickly. It's you know, it's, it's a three a ball. <laughs> <laughs> we will definitely share that uh, article uh, on duty of medical negligence. We'll give it to our team, uh, the big, you know, for marketing, who've been so uh, gracious to be with us every weekend, every week, and uh, be part of this webinars and organize the speakers as we pick and choose who want to speak to us uh, based on their knowledge and experience. So I just want to thank Kamu and the team marketing uh, for that and all of you for joining us this evening. And uh, we hope to see you again next week. And it's been an exciting uh, evening and uh, great information that we've gained uh, from this presentation. Thank you very much and have thank a you. good evening. Cheerio, thank you very much. Bye-bye, enjoy Leeds. <laughs> yes. Bye.